Hello and welcome again to this edition of Capital Dateline Online. I'm your host, Brad Swanson. We're coming to you just a few blocks from the Capitol at the headquarters of the Florida Cable Telecommunications Association. I am once again joined by my guest, Jim Saunders with the News Service of Florida. He's their executive editor and he's here to tell us what's happening this week and what we can look forward to. Jim, welcome. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, so we're here again. Session is, is uh, just ferociously uh, lunging at us. It's almost here. It's almost here. We've got a lot of news uh, in the mix. Uh, let's start out with the cabinet. What's happening uh, with the cabinet? Well, I think we all got a big surprise on Friday. Jeff Atwater uh, announced he was rep resigning as uh, the chief financial officer. He's going to take a job at Florida Atlantic University. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he's had some history with lo looking at working with the university. He as did. Well, at right? one point, he applied to be president down there, but he's from Palm Beach County. It's, it's home base to him. He's going to stay through the legislative session in the CFO job. But what this does is it, it allows uh, Governor Scott to fill, the un uh, fill that position uh, until through the, until the uh, 2018 elections. Right. So uh, the governor's going to get a big appointment here uh, probably in the next few months. And um, uh, cabinet positions are powerful. I mean, uh, they run big agency. Each cabinet officer runs a big agency, right. but they also deal with a lot of statewide issues, land buying issues, uh, oversight of the insurance uh, regula regulation, uh, financial regulation, those sorts of things. It's a big job, yeah. um, and it's a statewide elected position. Well, and frankly, the CFO, you know, it's it's uh, chief uh, fire marshal That's and right. uh, runs the checkbook for the state of Florida. There's one a ton of, largest... of tentacles that job has. A lot yeah. of a lot of things go unnoticed, but but it's. Uh, it's got a lot of lot, right. lot to it. Right. So. It's almost like some of those functions, if they're not noticed, it means that CFO is doing a great <laughs> job. And it's and that's that's a also a tough gig for an elected official to balance publicity with with doing the job itself. Right. So. It's a relatively low key job, I think, from a political standpoint, because there's sort of it's a lot of nuts and bolts involved. Right. But uh, but it is a very influential job. And um, you ironically, know, Atwater got more votes than any other cabinet member in their last election. Well, that's been one of the interesting things about Atwater is that he's been very successful politically. I mean, he got elected to the legislature in 2000, and by 2010, he was the Senate president. Uh, then he ran for CFO, and he's he just you know, the Democrats have not been very competitive uh, in a lot of these cabinet races, but he's done very well in these statewide races. His name's been mentioned over and over again for. Uh, races like U.S. Senate, uh, but he had pretty much put all that on, uh, said he wasn't going to run next year, right. and he could have run in 2016 and didn't. So, uh, but, but he's always in that mix. People right. always thought well of him and his political skills, uh, but now it looks like he's going to step back from the political world a little bit and go back into, well. uh, you know, uh, a decent paying job at Florida Atlantic University. Well, so. he's, he's certainly uh, had a distinguished uh, record of, of statesmanship and leadership, and so we're definitely going to wish CFO Atwater well in his next position. But let's talk about, this is Tallahassee, dominoes are starting to fall. Uh, who who do we hear of being in, in the potential mix for his replacement? Well, you know, as I said, this, this announcement of the resignation kind of caught a lot of us off guard. But uh, immediately, of course, the, the rumor mill started. Sure. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of names out there, and I'm going to forget some, but just uh, one is Carlos Lopez Quintero, the lieutenant governor, uh, that he may be a possibility to be for the appointment. Then you go into the legislature, Tom Lee, who's a senator from down in Hillsborough County. Uh, he ran for CFO in 2006 unsuccessfully, but he's made no uh, bones about his interest in that job. Uh, others uh, whose names have been mentioned are Jack Latvala, uh, uh, who's you know Senate Appropriations Chairman right. Joe Gruders, who is a representative from uh, from Sarasota County. Pat Neal. Pat Neal, who's a developer from uh, Bradenton, Sarasota, mm -hmm. that region. Yeah. Uh, another one that's uh, names po keeps popping up is Tom Grady, who is a former legislator from Naples and a friend of Governor Scott. Uh, his name has popped up on various things over the years, yeah. including he's a fi uh, he's well, not a finalist yet, but he's an applicant uh, for the Florida Gulf Coast University presidency. So there's a lot of names so popping other up. other than the lieutenant governor, it seems like the west coast of Florida is, is in the house or at the front of the line. Well, that's at least what we're seeing so far. But, you know, it's, uh, it, there could be, 
the thing about Governor Scott, sometimes he does unpredictable things too that a lot of people aren't talking about. I mean, they're pretty close to the vest administration. There could be names out there we don't know about at this point. One thing I think to keep in mind though is whoever gets that appointment, if they want to run in 2018, is going to have a, a leg up. Right. I mean, they're going to be a since they will be the incumbent essentially, and uh, they will that that provides them a lot of political power in terms of fundraising, organization. Uh, people get behind them. Name ID. Name branding. ID. Right. Uh, and unless they do something really they shouldn't do, uh, th that does give them an advantage. So uh, that's one of the other reasons this appointment is going to be so closely watched and is going to be valuable is right. because 2018 elections are coming fast. Well, when you talk about those dominoes falling, if it's a statewide cabinet pick and he, and he you know, happens to tap the lieutenant governor, for example, then he gets another appointment there. Or if he pulls right. a, a key senator out of the Senate and puts them in, that's another senatorial appointment right there. I mean, it really puts the governor in the driver's seat on some, some serious uh, influential um, uh, opportunities, if you will. Well, and I think, so. too, you got to remember that everybody thinks that that Governor Scott's going to run for the U.S. Senate in 2018. Right. So this appointment, also, he could be trying to uh, send messages to core constituencies, depending on who he chooses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if he chooses Carlos Lopez Quintero, maybe that will help him in Miami. Uh, I mean, that's just an example. But, uh, but you know, it, there's a lot of ripples that could go off of this, right. uh, this appointment. Right. So. Well, uh, so the other cabinet position that is open, it's not that the person's leaving, but we're looking at uh, uh, Senator Grimsley uh, just announced her intentions to run for that office. What's happening there? Well, all three cabinet positions are going to be open in 2018 elections, but Senator Grimsley, Denise Grimsley, who's from Sebring, uh, she became the first, I guess, statewide political figure to announce that she's going to run for one of the cabinet positions. She's going to run for agriculture commissioner in 2018. And um, she is uh, from a, a Sebring, a relatively rural area of the state. Uh, she comes from a, a family with background in, in rural, uh, in farming. Uh, she is very well respected in the legislature. She was a House Appropriations Chair while she was in the House. She also, one of the other things that she is probably best known for is that she helped lead the massive move to a Medicaid managed care system, uh, which is which really was a was a major change, controversial, but it was a major change, and she was a, a pretty key player in that. So um, she has announced that she's going to run in 2016. She's the first, but we're expecting others. Uh, you know, on the Republican side, a couple other names who've been tossed out is Matt Caldwell, who's a, a, a House member from down in Lee County. Uh, he's very involved in agriculture, natural resources uh, issues. Uh, another one whose name has popped up is Lisa Carlton, who's a former Senate Appropriations Chair. She's been out of the legislature for a while, but, uh, but she is one whose name has, has come up. Uh, those are all Republicans. We don't really hear much on the Democratic side at this point. Uh, they have not been very competitive in agriculture commission races uh, for a while. Mm. Uh, but there are three uh, cabinet positions open, along with the CFO, agriculture commissioner, and attorney general. You know, three months ago when we were talking, we all thought Pam Bondi was going to Washington to work right. for the Trump administration, and she's still here. Right. So we're not sure what's up with that, but right. she will be term limited in 2018. Yeah, well, it should be, uh, should be interesting to see how those dominoes fall, but I think we're going to have to wait till the end of session for uh, at least uh, CFO Atwater's uh, seat to see where that, that's going, but yeah. we'll stay tuned. All right, so next on the, the docket, we mentioned Senator Latvala in the last discussion, and he's playing a role in the Enterprise Florida Visit Florida debate. What's happening there? <laughs> Well, <laughs> things have kind of gotten nasty around the Capitol the last week or so, uh, primarily because of the split between the House and the governor, primarily on whether to fund and keep uh, Enterprise Florida and Visit Florida, these economic development agencies. The governor uh, today, Monday, has uh, started, uh, he's, he's making three appearances around this, across the state to try to try to bolster support for these two agencies, which House Speaker Richard Corcoran has pretty much said he wants to get rid of. The a House committee last week passed a bill that would just do that. It would eliminate those, those agencies. Now, I don't think that's going to pass in the end because the Senate will oppose it and the governor would veto it. But there is a very substantial issue about whether there will be funding for the, how much funding and whether there will be funding for those two, two agencies. 
The governor's proposed, I believe, is $85 million for Enterprise Florida for business incentives next year, uh, and another $76 million for Visit Florida for tourism marketing, and Corcoran wants none of it. So um, there is a big battle brewing. Last week it got kind of personal. Uh, the governor uh, kind of went after uh, Speaker Corcoran personally on it and said that, uh, intimated at least, that, that this opposition was politically based because Corcoran is getting a lot of talk about whether he'll run for governor or some other office. And that uh, the governor was basically saying that he thinks that Corcoran's uh, doing this for political reasons. Um, but the House is showing no signs of backing off. They went on and passed this bill that would, would eliminate these, uh, these agencies. So uh, the Senate so far has pretty much been in line with the governor, been supportive of the governor, maybe not as, as far as he wants to go on these agencies. But Senator Latvala, the Appropriations Chairman, very powerful. He has been you know, very supportive of continued uh, funding and continuing with these agencies. Right, so you've got the House on one side talking about how we're spending and their, their loss leaders and the numbers you know, aren't there to justify it. And then you've got the Senate using what, what is arguably traditional validation numbers saying it's a three to four dollar return on investment for the state of Florida. So, so we'll have to see uh, who well, prevails in the end. That's why the appropriations issue to me is the most important thing to watch. It's not this bill as much as the appropriations because uh, the speaker can block money. Uh, he, he can't force the other chamber to pass a bill, but he can block money. So uh, that's I, where I think really the battleground is going to be over the next well, couple Well, and months. that should just be one of many issues because, as, as I understand it, uh, the message has gone out to both senators and House members to make sure their leases run into summer uh, <laughs> for potential uh, special well, sessions. Well, you know, the, the speaker, uh, there was a big meeting of reporters and editors recently, and the speaker sort of joked, sort of didn't joke about, you know, if we go late, we go late. So there's a lot of talk around the Capitol about whether uh, they'll be able to get a budget right, done on right, time. Right. Tallahassee short-term property renters <laughs> rejoice, right? Business development uh, right there. Okay, so uh, on to our next issue. And uh, we've, we've got a few interesting issues moving that will um, definitely affect Floridians by and large, but the first one is a liquor-related issue, sometimes called door in the store, some kind, <laughs> sometimes called whiskey and Wheaties. Uh, this is about having an adjacent liquor store attached to a Walmart, a Target, a Publix. You've got parties on both sides. What's happening there? Well, the the bill looks like it's it's actually actually has a pretty good chance to to pass this year. It's moving in the Senate. Uh, this bill is is supported by Walmart and Target. And I'm sure there's some others, but those two are the biggest supporters. And basically, it would eliminate a prohibition era law that uh, that requires liquor stores to be separate from groceries and other merchandise. So uh, basically, Target and Walmart want to be able to have sell liquor within their stores. Um, it's being opposed by Publix, ABC, uh, liquor stores, and others. Um, who you know their business models are based on what that old law is. Um, so. But this has moved in this. This has moved in the Senate. It's started to move forward, and um, I think it's an easier has always been an easier sell in the House, where there is a bit more of a libertarian free market uh, mindset. There always has been in the House uh, on these sorts of issues, but. Um, but it's moving in the Senate, and it looks like it has a chance to uh, to get out of there. So. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, it's it's been sort of interesting to watch how it, how it has already started moving. So so with an issue like this, where you have retailers on both sides, and where would the Florida Retail Federation come down on an issue like this? Uh, you know, I'm not personally, I'm not really sure, but it puts them, I'm sure, in a difficult position, yeah. uh, uh, as well as other business groups. I mean, the chamber, uh, those types of groups that uh, that have members probably on both sides on of these sides. issues. Yeah. So. Uh, but I think the individual companies are kind of battling it out, is my sense at yeah, least. Yeah, well, we'll stay tuned for that. That'll be a big issue for sure. That'll be a, an oxygen getter uh, yeah. probably at the end. Well, you know, hour. it's one of those issues that in the whole scheme of things isn't, isn't the biggest deal in the state. But yet it's something that, that gets a lot of attention and there's a whole lot of lobbying going on about right, it. Right. Well, well, now we're, we're, we're back into uh, some fun stuff. The other one is uh, guns, stand your ground mm -hmm. specifically. Got a little traction last week, uh, but yet uh, the omnibus bill looks like that was broken up. What's happening in the world of uh, guns and firearms and, and rights to bear arms? Uh, well, again, this is moving fairly fast, so I think that the, the there's a stand your ground bill that I think probably has a pretty good chance to pass this year. It got hung up in the house last year, 
but uh, basically it shifts the burden of proof to prosecutors in pretrial hearings that are hurt, uh, held in, in stand your ground cases. Supreme Court ruled a few years ago that that burden of proof is on the defendants to prove that they should be able to argue stand your ground. This has been a big issue for the NRA. And it passed the Senate last year, but again, it got hung up in the House. It's already moving towards the Senate floor, and I tend to think it'll, it'll move in the House as well. Um, it doesn't seem to have uh, uh, a lot of roadblocks in its way. The other gun bills, though, are, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot, there's been some movement on that that sort of uh, makes you wonder uh, how, how good a chance they do have. Uh, Senator Greg Stubbe, the Judiciary Chairman, proposed an omnibus bill. I mean, this had, this had being able to carry guns on college campuses, it had to be able to carry guns openly in public if you have a concealed weapons license, allow people to carry guns in airport terminals. Uh, there were several elements to that bill. Uh, he wound up breaking that bill up and into individual bills, individual pieces. And uh, I think the thinking is it might be able to easier have legislators digest one or two of them or a right. few of them as opposed to trying to swallow the whole thing mm -hmm. because these bills are pretty much down the line controversial. Right. And uh, there's not uniformity, uh, uniform opinion among Senate Republicans about whether some of this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not, some of them have not been able to get out of the Senate in the past. And uh, again, it's one of those things, you, you think if they can get it out of the Senate, there's probably a good chance that these bills will pass the House. Some of them have passed the House right. in the past. But, uh, but Stubbe broke up the bill uh, into several pieces, and he looks like he's going to try to you know, pick and choose which ones to move forward with. Well, ultimately, uh, those gun bills uh, sometimes end up at the uh, Supreme Court. And uh, there's my awkward segue into another bill uh, talking about uh, term limits for uh, judicial term limits. That one cleared its first hurdle. What's what's the story there? Obviously, we've seen uh, we've seen some friction from. Well, this is another of Speaker Corcoran's big priorities: is to have uh, term limits for Supreme Court justices as well as appeals court judges. Uh, this there was a bill that was approved by a, a, a House committee last week that would. It's not quite this, this straight up, but it basically is 12-year term limits. They, they would be able to have a little bit extra time if they get a point, depending on their point. Right, right. But regardless, he's looking at basically uh, 12 years for these judges. Uh, he argues that this, is, this makes judges more accountable uh, to have term limits similar to legislative term limits. Um, one interesting thing, though, during the debate during this committee was that this bill got attacked by legal groups on both sides. It wasn't just uh, the Florida Bar who has opposed this type of thing in the past. Uh, there was a, uh, 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 conservative legal groups were also opposed. William Large, who is with the uh, Florida Justice Reform Institute, Florida sure. Justice Reform Institute, who actually uh, clashes quite often with the Supreme Court opinions. I mean, the, you know, the Supreme Court's fairly liberal, and uh, the Justice Reform Institute has come out on the losing side of some of these, these cases. But William, got up, William Large got up at this meeting and said, you know, we don't think this is a good idea to, to impose term limits. Part of the reason was that he said it's going to be a disincentive for young, talented lawyers to want to be judges. They have to leave their practices, could only be judges for 12 years, then they have to go back and rebuild practices or go back into private practice. Hmm. So um, that's one of the arguments they made. But it was sort of interesting, and the bar did oppose it. Uh, the bar has opposed this type of thing for right. a while. Right. But, Arguably uh, because the, the driving force behind these appointments typically is the legal community versus the rank and file voters. Well, that's probably one, one element of it. I mean, you know, they also argue that sometimes uh, uh, more experienced judges uh, are able to have a better perspective on things rather right. than, than judges just coming in for short periods of time and then going out the door. Yeah. So. Um, anyway, I, I'm not sure that this has much legs in the Senate at this point. We haven't seen uh, anything that's started moving in the Senate. But I do think, too, it may become an issue during the Constitutional Revision Commission, which will meet over the next couple of years to put issues on the ballot. I could see Corcoran trying to, trying to push it through there as well. Right. So, um, but it is a priority of his. It's been a priority for a while. And it, if it does make it on the ballot, it would require a constitutional change to do this. Right. If it gets on the ballot, it will be a battle royale. You can just about guarantee it. Well, what do we have looking uh, upcoming for the, the coming week? What are we looking at? Well, the uh, 
primarily in the legislature, uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about Governor Scott's budget proposal, uh, $83.5 billion proposal that he rolled out recently. Uh, Senate committees particularly are going to spend a lot of time this week focusing on that. In the House, there's uh, some interesting, uh, uh, prior, again, priorities of, of the speaker as well as his, uh, his team on health care. Uh, he has been pushing a number of issues related to health care deregulation, um, also changing the state health insurance program for state employees. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of talk in the House about those issues this week. Uh, one of the, for instance, one of the issues on the regulation side is getting rid of certificates of need, which has been a long-standing uh, regulatory process for building new hospitals and nursing homes right. and hospice faci Protecting facilities. Protecting common facilities investment. And, right. right. I mean, it's a, it's a big uh, inside the industry's really fight on that issue. Right. So um, there's issues like that that are going to be coming up healthcare-wise, which I think uh, you know, may, may get, get a lot of attention this week. All right. Well, thank you very much for those insights. Uh, we'll stay tuned and tune into New Service of Florida daily for what's happening. Uh, for now, that's all the time we have. Thank you for tuning in to Capital Dateline Online. For more news and views, check us out on our Facebook page or go to Cable in Florida for more insights. Have a great day.